In 2009, 300 people died in L'Aquila, Italy in an earthquake. In 2012, six scientists were convicted guilty of their manslaughter. It wasn't until November of last year that they were acquitted. Only after nearly five years of inquiry, litigation, stress, and uncertainty about their futures. Around the same time in 2009, ClimateGate occurred. ClimateGate is the commonly used name of, the of a cyber hack of the Climate Research Unit email server, where thousands of emails were leaked to the media and used by climate change critics and others denying the significance of human-caused climate change as evidence of a global warming scientific conspiracy whereby climate scientists manipulate the data to suppress the critics. As all this was happening, I felt overwhelmed with uncertainty about my future. I was finishing a master's degree and entering into a PhD program where I would study how wildfire, a different natural disaster, would change with climate. As I projected what my future would look like as a specialist in natural disasters like wildfire and climate change, I wondered if the media would misrepresent my, my findings. Would I too be held responsible for the subjective decisions people would make from the objective information I would give them? This couldn't be the way of my future. Something had to be done, but what? What could I do as an early career scientist to help facilitate the applicability of my work? As I read in the, the, the news about these events, it occurred to me that they were happening because of miscommunication. Miscommunication between scientists and the general public. This got me thinking. How does one communicate effectively? Well, I'll tell you a little story. When I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, doing my masters, my girlfriends and I decided that it would be really fun to hike up Arthur's Seat, a hill within the city, have a few drinks, and watch the sun come up. Not too much later, in the exact same conversation, we decided to have a night out. Excited for the adventure, I checked the weather, cold, damp, typical Scottish weather. So I got big boots, long underwear, a big, big down jacket, gloves, a knit hat, and although I'm wearing sunglasses here, I actually bought a flashlight because it was nighttime. And that later that evening, we met at the library, which is not nearly as studious as it sounds, as it was the local bar. <laughs> when I arrived, dressed like this, with my flashlight, I was completely mortified to see my girlfriends dressed to the nines in short shorts and high heels. <laughs> Apparently, in the UK, a night out is common lingo for a night out on the town. <laughs> I share this story because it demonstrates beautifully what I learned about effective communication. And that is that it stems from a common interpretation. So as a tribute to the Italian scientists, persecuted in part for not communicating well the risk of the earthquake, and to the climate change scientists under constant pressure to communicate uncertainty in their findings to the media and to the public. What I want to do today is to find a common interpretation of uncertainty to help guide decision making. Be that the decision to leave a potentially shaky city or develop a climate change adaptation strategy or any other decision that arises in life. Now to do this, it might be challenging because uncertainty can arise in many circumstances and it can evoke the full spectrum of emotions. In an informal survey of friends, family, and strangers, 60% of people told me that uncertainty made them feel anxious, challenged, nervous, uneasy. They described to me the full spectrum of emotions 
under which uncertainty occurs. Starting a new job or family, deciding a future, moving to a new place, choosing an insurance plan. The list goes on. We make decisions with uncertainty every single day. So the question is, if uncertainty evokes such strong emotions, how can we have confidence in the decisions we make when uncertainty is involved? And how, as in the case of professional decision makers, like politicians and managers, do we hold them accountable for the decisions they make? To do this, to answer this, we need to first divorce ourselves from emotion. And we must turn to math and science. We use math and science every single day. Even if we do not explicitly and consciously realize that we are using them, we use science to understand patterns in our observations, and we use math to quantify what we see. Now, quantifying things may be all well and good when your career or the public good is on the line, but for everyday decisions, quantifying things is really more of an abstract concept. For example, we know if most times we observe an outcome, or as my mom says, the outcome is six of one, half a dozen of the other, or the outcome is against the odds. So with that in mind, I hope to engage your intuition and articulate the logic to define uncertainty, confidence, and risk, and to discuss how these can be used either as intuitive concepts or quantifiable terms to help guide decision making. I'd like to start with a quote. There are known knowns. These are things we know we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. I chose this quote not only for its Dr. Seuss-like rhythm, <laughs> but because of the very clear definitions of confidence and uncertainty. I'm going to start with uncertainty. Because although this quote is logically true, I argue that for the case of interpreting uncertainty when making decisions, we must first understand what we don't know to provide context for what we do. With that, there are three types of uncertainty, only two of which were stated in this quote, known and unknown unknowns. Let me paint a picture. Imagine we're friends. Some of you are my friend, but some of you aren't. Imagine we're friends, or imagine a friend that you have who is often late, but they're not always late by the same amount of time. Known unknowns are explanations for why they may not always be late by the same amount of time. For example, they or I might live across town and I have to fight traffic. Traffic may explain some of the variability in my time of arrival, but some of the variability may not be entirely explained. Because we know there is something affecting my time of arrival, but we do not know what it is, it is a known unknown. Now, let's say in a future encounter, an unknown observation, you are uncertain of when to leave to meet me because there's a chance I might be on time. I told you I'd be on time. I promised you I'd be on time. This is an unknown unknown. The latter unknown being the unknown instance of my arrival, and the former unknown being the unknown outcome that I might show up on time. But just because I might show up on time doesn't mean that you will discard the pattern that I will probably be late especially not if you have high confidence that I will be late. Confidence is derived from the known knowns. The more observations you have that I am late, the more confident you will be that I will be late. But here's the thing. 
Confidence is both objective, as I just stated, but it's also subjective. Subjective confidence is defined as one's belief that an observation is true in support of an outcome or finding. So what does that mean? That means that you believe I'm late because your watch says that I'm late, but your watch is set slightly different than mine, or it's set slightly different from the atomic clock. This doesn't make your confidence in the observation any less true. It just means that your observation is based on the underlying assumption that your watch is accurate. This underlying assumption is subjective and thus can, can skew the probability of the outcome. This is what decision theorists call subjective probability. And if you think about it, subjective probability is really not that different from the intuitive understanding that there are many interpretations that shape our perception of reality and thus can affect the objectivity of our observations. So even though we have subjective probability, we don't lose confidence or certainty in our findings. We understand and we quantify subjective probability, which can be done, so that we can be transparent about those assumptions and then provide confidence in what we find. Okay, so we quantify things. Going back to professional decision makers. Why do we quantify things? We quantify things because numbers are comparable. But emotions, feelings, these vary based on the circumstances. Slightly different scale, magnitude, intensity, whatever you want to call it. It's really hard to say how your emotions in this moment compare to your emotions in another moment. So let's take everything I've said and let's turn it into numbers. Let's say we're 90% confident that there is a 70% certainty that I will be late. How do you translate that into the binary decision to leave now or to leave later? To take action or not to take action? To be or not to be? Because that's the question. To answer this, I'd like to go back to the beginning of this talk. I'd like to go back to my fear that I would be held responsible for the subjective decisions that people would make from the objective information I would give them. Because you see, my job and every other scientist's job is to provide information based on observations and to assess the role of their assumptions in those observations so that we can support decision-making. And the key word here is support, because we can't actually make those decisions. Making those decisions requires subjective value in the outcome of those decisions. This is the third type of uncertainty. The uncertainty of how one values the outcome. How one values the outcome determines the risk involved in the decision being made. And this is a really important point. Risk and uncertainty are not the same thing. Risk is entirely subjective. The more you value the outcome of a decision, the more risk there is in that decision. So because I'm a climate change scientist, I'd like to take a moment to put this in the context of something that will affect everybody's life in this room. In the latest inter intergovernmental panel on climate change report, a report of all the latest earth system science synthesized into one document that articulates patterns in climate and how that relates to the earth system as a whole, scientists found with at least 95% certainty that the recent change in climate is man-made. So what? What does that mean? 
Well, it means that of hundreds of thousands of observations, analyzed and scrutinized by tens of thousands of researchers, in tens of thousands of studies, in dozens of countries, all with slightly different subjective perspectives, captured by different underlying assumptions, we are at most 5% uncertain as to the source of our recent change in climate. So why do you hear in the media about so many people who are uncertain about how to interpret all this uncertainty? And all I can really do is remind you of the many emotions that uncertainty evokes and emphasize that the reason I'm here today is to find a common interpretation so that we can avoid miscommunication, use what we know to prepare us for what we do not. I'd like to take a slight, slight detour. I'd like to take a detour to explore the reason why we want to understand and quantify what is causing this recent change in climate. And the reason is to prepare us. Much in the same way that if we're friends and you know that traffic is a determinant in my time of arrival, you might just check the traffic report before leaving the office to meet me for happy hour. Going back to risk, none of this means anything unless you have a stake in the decision being made. And in the case of climate change, the decision is to develop or not to develop climate change adaptation strategies based on what we know to find the best method for adapting. So what does that mean intuitively? Let's play a game of roulette. The rules are as follows. If you choose correctly where the ball will land, you can use all the information we've ever gathered to protect your home, the mountainscapes, the oceans, the wildlife, the economy, your food, and water supply. Many of the things that you value most which number would you choose, one or zero? Now what if I told you that I developed this table so that the probability of getting a one was 95%, roughly equivalent to our certainty in what's causing man-made climate change, or what's causing climate change? Would you use what we know to protect what you love? So as in the case of climate change, if we value elements of the Earth system, be it ecological, economical, or sociological, the best chance we have of protecting it, the best chance we have of protecting what we love and value is to first find a common interpretation of uncertainty, understand our confidence in this interpretation, evaluate our subjectivity, and consider the risk of an unwanted outcome. Only then can we find a solution that uses what we know to prepare us for what we do not. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, in any aspect of your life, when making decisions with uncertainty, integrate what you know, account for what you do not, evaluate your subjectivity, and consider how you value the outcome of that decision. Thank you.